Good morning, River's Edge, and we welcome any guests who are joining us. We hope that when we're able to meet again here, that you will come and join us. You are welcome. Psalm 34 calls us to worship the living God today. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Let us prepare our hearts with a moment of silent and reverent anticipation before we sing and magnify the Lord. O Lord, our great God and King, you are great and greatly to be praised. And Lord, many of us have tasted and seen that you are good. And Lord, may we taste again this morning. And Lord, those who have not tasted, may they experience your goodness. Lord, may we lift these songs to you from hearts of thankfulness, hearts of trust and faith. Lord, as the psalm says, those who fear you lack no good thing. So may we not fear anything or anyone but you, Lord. And we know that your perfect love casts out all fear. That is not the kind that we need. But Lord, we need to trust you more. And so we've gathered, although not as we would hope to and want to, but Lord, bless your people this morning, and may we together now magnify and exalt your holy name. We trust in you to supply our needs because you are our good shepherd. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
standing, which I hope you were, even at home, you may be seated now, and we will have our oral teaching, the catechism, the Puritan catechism, question 65. Now that we've gone through the law of God, we will expound upon that. Question 65, is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? No mere man since the fall is able in his life perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but does daily break them in thought, word, and deed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And in light of the fact that in thought, word, and deed we break God's commands, take a moment and confess your sins. The Lord disciplines the son he loves, and we are his children by faith. Yet it displeases him when we break his command. It, it tells him that we don't trust him. And so take a moment specifically to confess your sins. Think of even the Ten Commandments, although there are many other sins and commands that you can commit or break. O 
Oh, Lord, hear your people as they confess their sins to you, as they cry out to you, as they humble themselves and repent. And, Lord, for those who have never called upon your name, that they would now repent and trust in you for the first time and continue to walk in faith and repentance. Lord, we have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we have not loved our neighbor as ourself. We have compromised. We have said that your word is not as important as you say it is. We have told others even that your commands are not maybe as important as you say they are. Lord, forgive us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you that you are faithful and just to do so because of your son and his blood, who was the perfect man, who was able to perfectly keep your law, and who purchased salvation for us and grants us your righteousness. It's in the name of Jesus we praise, praise you and pray. Amen.
Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. As we have worshiped the Lord through song and through his word, hearing it, and the call to worship, speaking of his commands and experiencing the confession of our sin and the forgiveness through the gospel. I want to remind you to worship through your giving. There's an opportunity online. There is a link on the top of this video. Wait until after. Otherwise, it will take you away from the live video. But there's a link there to give online and worship through your giving of tithes and offerings. And if you can't give online, there's a, the address for the church if you want to send a check. And we will worship the Lord now through the hearing of his word preached. Amen. Thank you, praise team. And I, I should say our IT team that has been such a blessing to us in this time. Please turn out there with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. I remind you we're jars of clay. It's the title of my message. We're not professional broadcasters. We're the church. So we have glitches and things go wrong and but we do our best during this time and soon we'll be together i just can't wait i miss you all so much i really do but here in chapter four paul's been saying we preach christ and not ourselves we don't lose heart it's been tough you know they've been dogging him chasing his enemies are after him tried to kill him he just he just escaped near death now in verse seven we have this jars uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay. What treasure? What's he talking about? He's saying Paul's ragtag team, his, his companions, his co-workers, carry this gospel. They're not professionals. They're jars of clay. We need to stop looking for glorious men to deliver the gospel to us. Uh, that's the tendency. You know, they didn't want humble David. They wanted somebody glorious to be their king, didn't they? No, God, throughout Scripture, shows us this is a principle. He uses vessels of dirt, jars of clay, to hold a glorious gospel. And so you have Paul and his companions, jars of clay, forming more jars of clay. Disciples. They're making disciples as they were commanded. Jars of clay make jars of clay. And what do they compose? What's this here? The steeple, you know, open the door and look at all the, whoops, I forgot to put the people in there. You know, it's the church. Jars of clay. 1 Corinthians 1.27, but God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God used Abraham who didn't know where he was going. He used Jacob, a lion mama's boy. He used, he used Joseph, a braggart, a jailbird, a slave. He used Moses, a stutterer, Gideon, a, a, he was the least of the least of the tribes of Israel, Rahab, a harlot. He used David, a shepherd boy. He used a teenage virgin, Mary, to birth the Son of God. He used a foul-mouthed Peter. He used a tax cheat. He used a couple of them, actually. He used uh, Matthew. He, he also used a wee little man, tax cheat Zacchaeus, as well. He used a demonic Mary Magdalene, and he uses now Paul, a murderer, to teach you and I about the church and the fact that we're jars of clay. Paul admits that he's a jar of clay, 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, that he's the worst of sinners. 
He repeats this idea in Romans 7, 15, that I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. He's a sinner. He's a jar of clay. And God uses him to deliver this glorious, perfect gospel to a Corinthian church, a, a quarreling, adulterous, incestuous, false teaching, gender-confused, blaspheming bunch of backstabbers. The Corinthian church. He loved them. Only God could have put a love in his heart for those people. They were horrible to him. Yet he values the church more than he does his own life, and he strives to be like Christ, who he himself died for his bride, the church. You and I are his bride. He loves us. He'll do anything. He gives his life for his bride. In Ephesians 5.25, he says, uh, Paul admonishes husbands. He admonishes you leaders out there of your families to do the same. But he's talking about his church. He's helping us understand that Jesus Christ dies for his church and that we should do the same. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And Christ laid down his life for you and I, for his bride, his church. We together, jars of clay, compose his church. Christ is the lamb without blemish, perfect. But he became dirt to save dirt, clay to save clay. Jars of clay, his church. Paul is a weak vessel, but he goes through hell to preach the gospel, that treasure of Christ crucified to the church. This is the legacy handed down to me through the apostles. Second century church father Tertullian challenged the Roman Empire's tyranny by saying that famous saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, the more you persecute, the more you tyrannize the church, the more Christianity is going to spread. And so the word of God, this is the treasure we're speaking about, the word of God, the, the gospel, the word of God, verse 7, call the church into being. This, this is the power to save. This is where the power is, the message of the gospel. As God said in verse 6, look at it. You can look at it. You know, you're, this message won't do you any good if you're looking for like a fancy schmancy three-point sermon sort of thing. We're actually preaching the word of God, not me. I'm not preaching myself. I'm preaching the word of God. So that you, you're going to need to glue your eyes to these verses. So it's, oh, yeah, that's exactly what, what this, this scripture is saying. Look at verse 7. The treasure called the church into being. And God said, let there be light. As, and, and what happened? There was light. He's referring to Genesis 1, verse 3. Boom. Let there be light. Boom. There was light. And God speaks to the church. What was dead comes to life. What was dark comes to light. Christ, like Paul, Paul, like um, like Christ, is going to die to get this gospel to the church. That's what's going to happen to him. Do you treasure the church that much? I, I bet you're starting to with this separation. Like Jesus, like Paul, what do you treasure in your heart? What would you treasure more than the church? And I can tell you that it's, it's not comparable. Whatever you would treasure. Why has God, do you ever ask that question? Why did he have mercy on me? Why did he choose me? Why did he pour his love out on me? Because you know there are Pharaohs and Judases that God doesn't pour his love out on. Why did he pour it out on you? 
so you could treasure the things of this earth? No. Really? Does it last? Never does. We live, Romans 12, 1, to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual act of worship. Because 1 Corinthians 6, 20, we were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's why we live. To glorify God. To shine for Christ. That's why we live, to proclaim this gospel, this treasure. The question to you this morning is this. Is the church precious to you? Is the body of Christ precious to you? The body that preaches and proclaims this powerful gospel, this life-changing, life-transforming gospel. Is it precious to you? You know, we said it on Easter that Mary Magdalene, she was lost. She, she couldn't find the body. She treasured the body of Christ. We, we said that Paul, the body of Christ became precious to him, but prior to that, he was killing the body of Christ. It was an interesting comparison between Mary Magdalene and Paul the Apostle. Is the body precious to you? It sure is to, to Paul now. Those jars of clay called out of darkness into Christ, they're the body, they're the church. And how are they called unless somebody preaches to them? We need preachers. And where are preachers found? The church. Individual jars of clay, temples of the Holy Spirit, the church, united, gathering to contain and preach this treasured gospel, jars of clay. We're dirt, but God uses us. It's amazing. Please stand if you will, even in your homes, to respect the glorious word of God. Let's read starting in verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. If you have ears to hear, hear the word of the living God this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we ask that you give us ears to hear your word and a heart desire to apply what we hear. God, we can't hear without you giving us these ears to hear. We thank you that you called us that you brought us to life and then called us through preachers that we might be changed by your living word, your word that says, let there be light, and there is light. God, let there be light in our minds, in our hearts. Renew our minds this morning by the power of your holy word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. So let's, let's uh, dissect this. Let's go back to verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. What treasure? The gospel with power to, the ch to change our lives, that treasure. I'll, I'll keep repeating this. Teaching is repetition, so we remember these things. It's the new covenant word of God. It's the new covenant. This is context. If you look at what we've been preaching in chapters 3 and 4, it's of, of, of greater glory than the Old Testament. This is an issue for Paul because these false apostles were trying to push the Old Covenant back onto the Corinthian church, okay? But this, this new covenant gospel is even more glorious than the Old 
covenant. And remember the old covenant, the word of God, the, the terrifying voice of God that had Israel begging Moses, tell him to stop, we're gonna die. Because the word of God is deadly. It's deadly, especially to sinners. The word of God in the new covenant is as deadly to sinners as the old. And sadly, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. It's deadly to us. But, and here's the new covenant, this is more glorious than the old, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. Right on. Praise God. It's life-giving to jars of death, jars of dirt, jars of clay, even to Gentiles, us, pork bacon eaters who believe. The new covenant is a promise. That's what covenant is. It's a promise. God keeps his, you don't keep your promises. Don't even think you do. God's the one who keeps promises. He's the one who's faithful. And he's more glorious. And this is new covenant is more glorious than the old. And so this treasure, this gospel, the way of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ forgives the sin of all who believes, credits righteousness to them by his grace, undeserving as they are, jars of clay, jars of dirt. God loved us before he formed the earth. And he chose out of the earth, out of the dust of the ground, frail vessels to show his glory. How'd he do it? How'd he do it for you and I? In the new covenant, in the old covenant through the prophets, in the new covenant through the apostles, handing it down to more jars of clay to preach, to pour this vintage wine into dirt cups, vintage wine. That the, there's only one wine. It's, it's <laughs> the wine of, it's 2,000 years old, vintage. It can only be found in the gospel, in the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7, we're to show, not hide this treasure, this goodness, that saves our souls, to glorify God. Sure, some are going to mock you when you do this. Some will think you're showing off. But that's what we're supposed to do is shine. Not show off, not show ourselves, not, not preach ourselves. We never do that. It's no good. There's nothing there. But they'll mock you, and they'll think you're showing off. It's the mild persecution that all Christians face. It's entry-level Paper cut persecution. If you can't take that, guess what? You test negative for the Christianity virus. Negative. God's given us this treasure in jars of clay. Know this. It leaves us with no excuse. No matter how poorly you think of yourself, well, good. You're, you're even more qualified. God doesn't share his glory with any, anybody. Your lack of talent your lack of worldly value is to show that the serpent, look at it, it's right there. I'm preaching the word of God here to you. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We proclaim Christ, not ourselves. So no one gets credit, that no man may boast. Paul and his co-workers are jars of clay. Here, pouring out this vintage gospel, the only gospel that unites dirt jars, the Corinthian church. That's the immediate context, the immediate meaning. But we gather this same meaning for ourselves today. This is how we apply it. And so we proclaim this gospel the best we can. You know, I, I'm just like, I, before coming up here, I just, oh, Holy Spirit, don't let your people down. I'm, I pray that God would speak to you today. I'm a jar of clay. I can't do this. I can think of a million reasons why I, could, I shouldn't do this. But we proclaim it the best we can. 
I do, you do. We're all to proclaim it. And so we find our preacher and help him preach. If you can't preach very good, we'll find a preacher and help him preach. It's false teaching that argues you don't have to belong to a church. Can I say that again? It's absolute false teaching. It's a lie that you don't have to belong to a church. You don't find that in Scripture. You want to follow the Word of God, don't you? That's what Christians do. They don't make it up as they go. They don't say, oh, communion, peanut butter and jelly at home on virtual Facebook. You know, you don't, you don't do this stuff. You don't make it up as you fly. And that's my concern because there are false teachers out there that teach a lie. The church gathers. We find our preacher, we find our church, and we help him preach. It's false to believe you don't have to belong to a church to be a Christian. It swims against the current of consumer religion that wants to hop and shop and bop and go here and there and pop around to other churches, you know. Well, try and find something that makes me happy and snappy, you know. No. Every team has a roster. Can you imagine a football team where people are, ah, we lost a game. Doggone it, I'm going to go over to Cass City. I'm sick of Lakers. Ah, I'm done here at Lakers. We lost a game going over to USA. Yeah, that's really, that really works, doesn't it? Ah, you're in the U.S. Army, yeah. You know, every school has an enrollment. Every, every team has a roster. Every army has an li- enlistment. We're members one to another. Romans 12, 4 says, For as in one body, the church, we're speaking of, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Members of one another. Have you thought of the church that way? Are you an American rugged individualist doing your own thing? Be careful. That's not what the Bible teaches Christians are. We're a community. We're a community. The Bible teaches that God appoints preachers, teachers, and evangelists. Where are you going to find that? You find that in the church. That's where you find that. Lone Ranger false teachers who appoint themselves preach against the Bible that commands us to encourage the church and attend the church, attendance, gather, we're told. We're told here in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For the, no hopping and bopping, okay? For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, not neglecting to meet together. Other translations gather, not, not neglecting to meet together, it's a big deal. They did daily in the early church. They gathered together daily, Acts tells us in the second chapter. Daily. Not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? I tell you what, this this pandemic is insane. I don't understand. I, I got to tell you, I'm confused by the whole thing. As the numbers come out and I'm just confused. I don't, this is crazy. Do you see the day approaching? Hey man, we need to gather according to scripture as dr- judgment draws near, as the day approaches. As you, do you think Do you think it's closer than it was 2,000 years ago when these words were written? Do you think maybe? Do you dismiss the day of judgment? This idea of judgment day drawing, hell, fire, damnation, preachers. Ha! You laugh at them? Do you mock it? Listen, God rules all things. There's not a molecule that races out of his control, as R.C. Sproul says. There's not a virus that races out of his control either. This virus is judgment. Look at it however you want. God could have 
made it not happen because he's sovereign, he's Lord, and he didn't, and we have it. And even if it's a fake virus, if it, even it's, if it's overblown, all of what has happened to us the last two months is not out of the control of God, yet God in his sovereign power, Lord over all the earth, allowed it to happen. So here we are. You can mock God. You can laugh at me. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm a jar of clay. You, I, I can't be proud. And I'll, I'll lose friends by saying it even professing Christians who mock this sort of thing. We mock God in America with our silent consent, with regard to abortion, with regard to gender confusion and gay marriage and just breaking down and tearing down the family, laughing at the old thought of what family actually was. And it's, it's confusion. Do you see the day approaching? Is it safe? It's never been safe. It's never been safe. Run, <coughs> repent, run, run to your embassy. Where's your embassy? The church, the kingdom of God. That that's what the church is. Representatives of the kingdom of God. We're, we're, we don't belong in this world. We're visitors on this planet. Don't mock God, run to God. And here we are, the united jars of clay that contain this, this treasured gospel in this embassy. It's a safe place. Better than hunkering down at home, cowering in fear, that's for sure. It's the hope of glory, the hope of heaven. The church represents the kingdom of God. And if you feel like you don't belong around church people, you feel uncomfortable, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. That's not right. You ought not, are you more comfortable around people who sin? True Christians should feel at home with Christians and uneasy around willful sinners. There are some Christians who willfully sin they're walking in sin. They haven't repented. Run from them. Come to the embassy. Come where it's safety, where God saves souls. The church is the only place that you can obey these 59 one another commandments that we find in Scripture. I'll go over a few of them. The Bible says that we're to love one another. The Bible says that we're to be devoted to one another, live in harmony with one another, instruct one another, greet one another, serve one another, carry each other's burdens. We're to be patient with one another, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. We're supposed to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're supposed to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Imagine that, thinking of others better than yourself, like, like Philippians chapter 2 says. Admonish one another, encourage each other, spur one another on toward love and good deeds, offer hospitality to one another, wash one another's feet. Jesus said, I've given you example. Put the towel on, get your hands dirty, and wash a dirty foot because we're jars of clay, jars of dirt. You can't do that in a grocery store. This isn't some generalized command here. Just, you know, People take these things and think, well, well, this is the way we're supposed to. No, you do this in the church. You can't receive communion at McDonald's. You can't get baptized at the gas station. No, we belong in a church. This is practice for heaven, the place where we belong. This is, this is a foretaste of glory divine, as the song says. But Lone Ranger professing Christians are false teachers, teaching that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. It's true. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian, but every true Christian is going to find a church with a Bible preacher who preaches verse 7. Look at it. Shows, proclaims that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. And Paul said in Philippians 2.15, we shine as lights in the world to show, proclaim this treasure. Now, now that God has separated us by this 
COVID-19 pandemic, we should show even all the more. Show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. You should feel disciplined. If you've just dismissed that kind of thing, I think you're out of line. You should feel disciplined by your heavenly Father that loves you. We've been separated by God's will, by his sovereign will. We should repent and cherish the church, the safe embassy of the kingdom of God. Romans 12, 5 says, we're individually members one another. Now more than ever, we should treasure each other in this God-ordained separation. Church affliction historically means church growth. When crushed, she's not destroyed. She doesn't quit. She multiplies. Will you show? Will you proclaim the gospel she carries? Will you change by the power of this gospel message? We ought to have a revival in America. Awakening. Change. Or are you going to slide back to where you were? You got the paycheck from the government. You're going to trust in God and not the, or trust in the government and not God. Maybe get another paycheck later on if things are bad. Everything's fine and good. You get all comfortable. and Man, I want to get out. Preach the gospel. I don't know about you. Determine in your heart to preach and proclaim the gospel. Well, I'm too shy. I can't. Well, perfect. You're perfect. Because the more you stutter and stumble around, uh, you show how much you treasure the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, the, and that person is going to hear it from you. You're uniquely qualified. God will qualify you. You're supposed to be a jar of clay. You're useless in and of yourself, but God makes you infinitely valuable. By his death on the cross, imagine the Son of God dying for you. He values you greatly. And what is this that we proclaim? Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected. Crucified for our sins and resurrected to give us his righteousness. Oh, God is so good. And so churches are filled with jars of clay. They're going to be filled with sinners, resurrected from the dirt, to be justified, sanctified, and glorified. They're all in process until they're glorified upon their death. They're made perfect forever. We're being perfected over time. They're sinners. And we need to learn to be patient with sinners. Just as Christ is patient with us. It's work being with, with sinners getting impatient with them, you know? Some of you have to be patient with me, big time. But you must find the resting presence of God. We're told where two or more are gathered in his name to hear the teaching of this treasured gospel. Today, we hear it from Paul. And it's preached to you from a guy like me, jars of clay. And so in this quarantine, do you find yourself treasuring the church that Jesus died for? He treasured it. He died for it. Paul treasured it. He died for it. Do you love what he loves? Or do you actually like the break? Do you like the virtual church better? You'd rather do that. You don't have to deal with dirty jars of clay who are, you know, unpleasant and say dumb things and you know, you're you, you tired of that? You like the virtual church better? You don't have to get your hands dirty. Don't have to wash people's feet, you know? You can just sort of love from a distance, you know? Words, 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 all I hear is words. I hate to say it, this isn't church. What we're doing here, I'm preaching to you, but this isn't church. Church is when we gather. We have to gather and be amongst one another. That's what church, church, Christ didn't have a Zoom Facebook relationship with the 12 disciples. That's not what he had. That's not how it works. The apostle Paul doesn't quit the church either. He keeps going. And by God's grace, Ryan and I and the elders, we keep going. And our team of worship leaders and techies, we, 
We're working hard here to make this work. We don't quit. Paul goes through hell getting the gospel to the Corinthians. And in return, what do they do? They question his apostleship. They listen to these false teachers and these false apostles. That's the thanks he gets. And he has to be patient with them to help them have greater confidence in him. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. He knows this, but they think they know stuff. <laughs> they think they know stuff. They, they, they want to school him. And it's his job to school them. It, it's, it, he's got to be patient with them. And here he's risking his life to preach to them, and they are so ungrateful. He wants them to trust his message, this treasured message to trust God, not him. He's saying, I'm a jar of clay. I, they need to stop being dazzled by peddlers and big mouths. That's what they need to do, and so do you and I. And they can gain this understanding because of all of his afflictions, because of all he's gone through. He's a jar of clay. He's just a delivery boy for a vintage wine. Jesus Christ pouring out his blood for his church. Does anybody love you like that? Can you imagine? There is no other gospel. This is the only wine. Who loves you? Pretty mama. <laughs> I remember that song. Who loves you? Jesus. No one loves you like it pours out his blood for you. We're afflicted in every way, verse 8, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Christians should never be desperate. In these times, Christians should not be desperate. This world is always a risk. The embassy of the kingdom of heaven the church is secure. Go there. The Apostle James taught us to, in, in, in James 1, verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God is perfecting us through this crisis. Crisis sanctifies Crisis sanctifies. This is a good work of God in all of us. I know that you, River's Edge, cherish your brothers and sisters even more than you ever did. And this is perhaps the only way you could have learned how much you love one another and how much you need one another. We got a little economy within ourselves right here. We love one another and take care of one another and serve one another and wash one another's feet. We need each other. Some of you have more than others. And so that makes you afraid. You're afraid they're going to take your more, you know. Now we help one another out. We come together. We're strong. Amen. And so in the uncertain times, we do well to remember that it was never the certain times that, they, that, that, that we thought they were. Never. Death is always certain. You're going to die. I don't know if you knew that, but you're going to die. You will die. And it might be COVID-19. Are you prepared? Well, the gospel is the only thing that will prepare you for that. The hope of, of Christ crucified for my sins, buried, dead, and resurrected. The hope of the resurrection. The gospel. You're going to die. It's certain. Times have always been uncertain on this earth, but the embassy is solid, baby. It's safety, my friend. It's certain. What were we thinking? Let us look to a world where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death and suffering, that we would be fearless in this earth, fearless, courageous, preaching the gospel no matter what anybody, anybody thinks. This is the faith of old. This is Hebrews 11, the, the beautiful... Uh, hall of fame of, of faith. And, and it says this, for, for people who speak thus, and we're speaking of Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the heroes of old who showed their faith. He's saying, for people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking 
a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. That's where our mind is set on. This earth is uncertain. It always was. We're going to die. But in that world, they said, we're just visitors here. In, in heaven, it, we'll never die. That's the certain world. Where's your head at? We all need to pull our heads out and get them straightened up today in the Word of God. This is why we need the Word of God every Sunday. You need it every day on your own. And we come together for preachers to open our eyes to new things. And so we're not, look at verse 8, driven to despair over this crushing virus. Because it reminds us heaven's our home, not this broken world. There's nothing in this world that offers the resting presence of God. Like this treasure that we carry inside the gospel. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, my friends. Together we form the church. If God appoints us to die on this earth, bonus, we get to go to heaven where there's no more sorrow, where there's rest in paradise forever. Verse 8, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Paul's exhausted himself. Having narrowly escaped death, we should have his attitude. What is it? Afflicted in every way, not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Paul was abandoned. He was forsaken. He was forsaken by Demas, by Barnabas, by John Mark. John Mark wrote the book of Mark. He abandoned him. But God would never leave or forsake him. And if that wasn't enough, when Paul's enemies would finally catch up with him, look at verse 8, when they'd finally catch up with him, he was often struck down. He would, we're going to be told here later in this uh, book of 2 Corinthians how many times he was beaten with rods and whipped and flogged. He almost drowned. I mean, the guy was... Like I said last week, he was like Wiley e. Coyote, just constantly getting beat up and getting back up and going back after the roadrunner. You're the roadrunner, I'm the road. You know, we're, he preaches to us, chasing it down, delivering this gospel. As God delivered him time and again, until finally God did take him home with one final quick blow by Caesar himself, by the leader of the Roman world chopped his head off, beheaded him. But Paul's saying, for now, I'm alive. I don't know why I'm alive. I should be dead. But as long as I am alive, I'm going to preach the gospel from this jar of clay that I am. I'm, I'm nothing. It's all about the gospel. 1 Peter 2, 9. Go there, would you? Go to 1 Peter 2, 9. Because this is why we live in this world. I want to point out something to you. That, that a lot of people, another false teacher or teaching out there is that we don't need to proclaim the gospel. That's for preachers and Billy Graham. That's a false teaching. That's not true at all. The Protestant church has always believed in the priesthood of the believer. We're supposed to shine. We're supposed to show, it says here in our text today. Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race. God chose you, jar of clay that you are. A royal priesthood, priesthood of all believers. What do priests do? They hear the cry of the people. They present the gospel, the good news to them. They, make, they help redeem people and, and help them make peace with God. A royal priesthood, we have redemption in the gospel. We can preach the gospel and they can believe and change their life. You're a royal priesthood. That's all of us. All of us jars of clay together, a holy nation of people. And none of this rugged individualism that people are preaching out there, none of that. A people for his own possession that you may proclaim, proclaim, proclaim. That's what we do, all of us. Not just the preacher, not just Billy Graham, all of us. And 1 Peter 3, 15 says, always be prepared to give a reason for, for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. We proclaim the gospel the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He said, let there be light, and there was light in your life. And when we proclaim the gospel, the same thing happens. Now go back to verse 10. 
We've always believed in the priesthood of all believers to proclaim the gospel in this life, in this earthly tent. So you need to let your light shine. Jar of clay that you are. And especially in this crisis as we see the day approaching. And this is how the light spreads. Look at verse 10, always carrying in the body of death Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be also manifested in our bodies. This is the point. Whatever Paul faces, it's his opportunity, your opportunity to manif manifest Christ. It's the same with us, whether, whether a virus, whatever trial, and some of you are trying to keep your businesses afloat. There's a lot of real tension out there. Some of you are just trying, you were a paycheck away from disaster. Now you lost your job. You got a little money from the government, but you're toast if you don't find work. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to not panic and cower in our homes in a fetal position. Okay. It's a chance, verse 7, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. To show Christ as our great treasure. Do you do that in this crisis? While you're losing your retirement, while you lose your health, while you lose your business. Yes, you can. You can't do it if you're going to be a cowering germaphobe. Honestly. Is that what you want to be, Michael Jackson, Howard Hughes, you know? Is that you're washing your hands every five seconds, you know? I'm not, I'm not belittling this thing. I, I'm, I'm a team player. But we can't, this is unsustainable, my friends. Okay, the numbers are coming out. A little confusing out there, isn't it? Are you going to just stay in your home forever? It's, it's, it's impossible. Listen, John Augustus Shedd said this. He said a ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. You can stay in the harbor forever? Thank goodness for Christopher Columbus, huh? I mean, he was heading to the edge of the earth. He was going to fall off the flat earth. Are you going to do the same? It's not what we're made for. Come on. Look at verse 11. For we who are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul's dying to get the gospel to the Corinthians. It's his reward that they would be saved. It's my reward, my great joy to see you saved and see you grow in Christ. He's dying for their life in Christ. He's like the man on dog sleds going through hell to get the serum through to Nome, Alaska, where they had the diphtheria. And there are some 26. This is where the Iditarod uh, comes from. 26 different mushers with their dog sleds racing this serum to Nome, Alaska. One of the guys uh, it got so bad he had, to, he had to tear open one of his favorite dogs that he loved rip its guts open so he could stick his hands in there so his hands wouldn't freeze to death. This is Paul. Worse, much worse to get this gospel, to get the serum through, my friends, to get it through. Do you have the gospel? Paul's committed to the church. Are you? He'll die delivering this treasure to the church. Will you? The gospel that saved all of us Jesus, bruised for our sins. He became sin who knew no sin. The pure lamb of God for dirt jars. Jars of clay. You and I. The very people he himself formed from the dust of the ground. That's commitment. That's commitment. Are you committed to the church like this? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we're jars of clay. We're dirt. Yet your gospel spoke life, spoke light into our hearts. God, raise us. Raise this land. Awaken this land. Speak light to America who has so offended you, who has mocked you. And your word says you will not be mocked. Let us 
repent of our sin, of viewing abortion as a political, unsavory subject and have made ourselves silent, of making ourselves silent over gender confusion and gay marriage because we don't want to be mocked and beat up by those with big mouths. Lord, your mouth is big to me. Your mouth, your word, I love it. I love your word. I'm committed to your word. I'm committed to your church. Lord, let me carry this in this body, the death of Jesus Christ. Let the world beat me up. I don't care. Let me preach your gospel. Lord, may your people hear it and proclaim it as well. By the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, would you stand with me and let's sing a closing song. I'm going to sound really dumb up here singing all by myself. Let's sing glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. How about we try, okay? Mm, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. You should hear it in there. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and I hope we can maybe gather in a safe way next week. We'll be looking into it, and we'll be reporting to you through email. If we don't have your email, text it to us on Facebook. We love you. Have a great Lord's Day. God bless.